out of the pool. Mr. President, members of the Presidential Party, on behalf of Governor Tia, United States Senator Mark Hatfield, Congressman Denny Smith, and our forest products industry, let me welcome you back to Oregon, and more specifically, Klamath Falls, Oregon. We are extremely grateful that you are taking time out of your very, very busy schedule to be with us here today, Mr. President. This is also an historic occasion for our industry. To our knowledge, you are the first president to meet with such a large and representative group of our forest products industry and even on our home ground. The group assembled before you, Mr. President, is a diverse cross-section of our Western industry, ranging from large, fully integrated companies to smaller family-owned companies such as my own. At times it seems that the only thing we have in common is that we're all competitors. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce you to my fellow panel members, Mr. President. On my immediate left is Mr. Bill Swindells, the President of Willamette Industries, Portland, Oregon. Mike Burl, President of EF Burl Lumber Company, Medford, Oregon. Mr. Archie Emerson, President of Sierra Pacific Industries, Arcadia, California. Mrs. Barbara Jedlow, President of Oregon Cutstock and Molding, Medford, Oregon. Mr. Uh, Paul Sagner, President of the Oregon Loggers Association. Next to Mr. Hanscom is Mr. Alliance group, Mr. President, and your immediate right, Mr. Charlie Bingham from Warehouser Construction and the demand for lumber and plywood. Demand for these products has recently shown encouraging improvement over the devastating levels of the past several years, and this is reflect, reflects an increase in housing starts. This new demand has enabled some of us to reopen mills that have been closed for weeks and even months we can report a definite level of inflation. The rampant inflation of the state rates are trending towards more reasonable levels. Although sometimes the cure seems worse than the illness, we realize that in the long run, inflation could destroy us. Battles concerning which land should be set aside for wilderness. This caused continued uncertainty concerning timber supplies. This half again of the very able people at Warehouser were absolutely delighted to have you here at Klamath Falls. We've operated here in this community continuously since 1929. We have consistently reforested our lands, modernized our plants, and broadened the product line. We feel like we're a part of the fabric of this community. As a company, like those wonderful people you met a few moments ago, we're tree farmers. We, uh, and we are illustrative of one of the unique parts of this industry. We're the only industry that's raw, whose raw material is renewable. Uh, it takes a long time to grow a crop, but uh, we're here to stay. And for that reason, I've been asked to talk about two longer-term issues. Please bear in mind that we bought this timber before the government began their environment that no longer exists. No one wants to return to that environment, and yet this timber cannot be economically harvested, even in the good markets we hope are coming. Mr. President, the forest products industry is now working on several alternatives as possible solutions to our- Thanks to hear from you. Well. Let me, without directly replying to the things that have been said, because I know we'll take care of that in the question and answer session that follows, but Governor Atiyah, Senator Hatfield, and Congressman Smith, and the people of Klamath Falls, I want to 
thank you all for welcoming me here and for these informative reports. These are critical times, I know, for your industry, your workers and your families. But my visit here and our improving economy convinced me that together uh, we can and will put the people of Klamath Falls and the rest of America back to work. First, let me say what a pleasure it is for me to be in the great Northwest. I mean, when the rest of the country hears the name Oregon, I think everyone thinks of a rich green land that lured so many West explorers, traders, and lumberjacks to a state of tall timber and wilderness. And when William Cullen Bryan wrote that forest groves were God's first temples, he must have seen the majestic sweep of Oregon in his mind's eye. But as you've said, Oregon and her mighty lumber industry have suffered greatly from this last recession. Mills shut down, workers were laid off, and businesses closed across the state. These problems were triggered by profligate spending, excessive taxation, and burdensome regulations imposed from the other side of the nation in Washington, D.C. Deficit spending and a tax system which allowed the federal government to profit from inflation drove up prices. Interest rates hit 21.5%, and suddenly the American dream of owning a home seemed an impossibility for millions of people. With the housing industry on the rocks, the lumber industry ground to a halt, and Oregon's mills and forests fell silent. But in 1980, the people of Oregon, recognizing what was happening, voted an unmistakable mandate to clean up our economic mess. And in the last two years, that's just what I think we've been doing in Washington. We've begun returning America to the strict principles of economic responsibility that made us great in the first place. We've made great strides toward limiting government's role in our marketplace and in the lives of our people. We've cut the growth in new regulations by a third and government's rate of growth by 40%. Incentive, hard work, and savings are being rewarded again by a reformed tax policy. We all set the largest tax hike in history that had been passed during the previous administration. We offset it with the largest tax cut in history. The third installment of the tax cut rate will take effect in a few short months, and America's working families will reap the most benefits. Our tax indexing provision also ensures that cost of living raises won't push workers into higher tax brackets. Meanwhile, we're tackling the monster of deficit spending, which still threatens the road to recovery. We've proposed a budget and a fiscal plan that will steadily reduce federal deficits until eventually we balance the federal budget. As a result, the economy is finally revving up. New home sales, as you know, in January were up 10%. And that was more than a 50% improvement over the same month last year. Housing starts increased by 36%, and that was the largest jump in history. Permits to build were up by 13% to the highest level since September of 1980. Overall, construction spending rose nearly 9%, and that was the most dramatic improvement since 1946. And the increase in the sale of existing homes broke all the records in the books. Something exciting is happening. You can feel it in Klamath Falls and I think in towns all across America. Inflation has risen at an annual rate of only 1.4% for the last six months. And that's down from the agonizing 12.4%, which was the annual rate when we took office. That success, along with a moderate monetary policy, has enabled interest rates to come down, key to our recovery. Many people just don't realize the parallel between the two, and this was why inflation was our prime target from the very first day in office. If you're going to lend money, and the value of that money is depreciating because of inflation, you have to get an interest rate high enough to not only bring an earning on your money, but to offset that depreciated value so that when the dollars are given back, you receive the same purchasing power that you loaned in the first place. Well, those dry rates dropped again last week and are now less than half of what they were in 1980. I believe they're going to go down even farther. 
Lower, more le realistic interest rates are unlocking the chains that are binding our people, our businesses, and our economy. Still more improvement will free us to create the kind of prosperity that was our heritage and that we must restore for ourselves and for our children. Already, overall productivity is improving. Our automobile industry is rebounding and real wages are rising for the first time in several years. Unemployment, though still painfully high, has begun to dip and the leading economic indicators have been signaling recovery for eight out of the last 10 months. The latest report on those indicators released this week showed the largest monthly gain in more than 30 years. Now, all this is good news for Klamath Falls, for Oregon, and for America. After nearly a three-year slump, the forest products industry is coming back. I just left a lumber mill that has reopened, and I can tell you the whir of the machinery there was music to my ears. Since February of 1982, about 475 plywood mills and sawmills around the country have reopened or resumed full production. Here in the West, the number of employees directly affected by sawmill closures or production curtailments is half what it was a year ago. Loggers and sawmill workers are going back to work. And when people in Klamath Falls go back to work, it means that paper makers, carpenters, home builders, and an endless array of others across America are also being called back to the job. Now, I know times are still very difficult. We're not out of the woods yet. Maybe in this particular place, I should put that another way. <laughs> You're not back in the woods yet as much as you would like to be. Your industry is still operating far below capacity. And many thousands of workers here still wait for that call back notice. But our recovery is building and gaining in strength. And I believe it will be powerful and sustained. We've had seven previous recessions since World War II, in every one of which government rode to the rescue with a quick fix and an artificial stimulant and guaranteed that within in anything from two to three years, we would have another recession, and it was always worse than the last. Each one started with a higher level of unemployment to begin with and with a higher inflation rate. This time, we've tried to go back to the basic rules of economics that built this country and have a recovery that is based on common sense business practices and that will be lasting and that will be without inflation. I. I believe it will be powerful and sustain this recovery. It should be because, as I say, it is the result of time-tested, common-sense economic principles that have worked when they've been tried. When I began speaking today, I described how other Americans view your abundant national wealth out here. I would like to add that when we think of your people, we think of independent men and women of strength and foresight, imbued with a frontier spirit. I wish the rest of the country could see and hear what I have today, because they would realize how richly that reputation is deserved. I think they'd appreciate, as I do, that the Oregon spirit is the American spirit. And with that spirit, there is no challenge too great for us to overcome. They say that out here in the great Northwest, the trees grow so high that it takes a whole week to see the top of them. Well, it's that way with good results, too. Sometimes the reward comes a long spell after you begin the effort. But anyone who's looked out over the top of an Oregon forest knows how worthwhile the wait can be. So I thank you for your vision, your hard work, and your faith in America. And together we're putting our country to rights again, and I think it'll be worth the effort and the wait. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity, and God bless you all. But let me anticipate in the line of questioning just a couple of the things that were said here earlier. Uh, I recognize some of the problems that have been pointed out here. Uh, I have a man right now working, investigating everything administrative that can be done with regard to the, this particular problem here. Uh, and we are going to continue to work on that to find out, uh, first of all, all that we can do administratively. There are other things that have been brought up here that I know will be repeated in the questioning, so I'll stop and let us get to that questioning. That's what I've been looking forward more to than making a, a speech. So 
Thank you, Mr. President. We, we do have some, some good news for you, too, and I think John Stevens wants to share a little bit of that with a question or two. Mr. President, since last fall, our company employment has increased by over 750 full-time jobs. All of our plywood plants are now running, and we've realized a 13% productivity improvement in that same period. Now, this improvement is partly because of market recoveries, but the most important reason were the short-term timber contracts made available to us from the Forest Service and the BLM. Will these kind of contracts continue to be available? Yes, I, I don't think there would be any change in that at all. And as a matter of fact, all of you know better than, than most uh, some great misunderstanding, for example, about our national forests and, and the BLM and, and land and all. Uh, I ride fairly regularly through a national forest in the east now when I can get to Camp David. And I'm amazed, and I know you're all aware, of what people think is, is nature being preserved, but how such a useless tangle and then the taking over by uh, lesser valued trees is taking place because there is a lack of harvesting uh, in there that would keep those forests more alive than what they were supposed to be. But the tangle of downed trees that have been allowed to mature, grow old, and then before their harvest uh, succumb to insect and age uh, reveals that we have a long way to go in recognizing the assets we have and making full use of them, and at the same time, retaining better forest land for those who want it for <coughs> recreational purposes and all than we presently have. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. President, our company and many other small companies like ours have endured heavy financial losses the last couple of years. We can't survive another downturn. Can we count on interest rates continuing at their present levels or hopefully lower? Hopefully lower, because we're going to continue the fight against inflation. That, you know, most people have forgotten that for more than 30 years, inflation was a deliberate, planned government policy. They called it the new economics. And I remember being out on the mashed potato circuit about 25 years ago complaining about it, that it wouldn't work. They said that a little inflation uh, was necessary to maintain prosperity. Well, I said a little inflation is like radioactivity. It's cumulative, and pretty soon it gets out of control, as it has. And as I say, these last six months, for the year of 82, the official annual rate was 3.8 down from that 12.4, but for the last six months, it had been running at 1.4. And uh, even industry had a part in contributing to institutionalizing that. When industry yielded wage contracts that raised wages above increase in productivity, then that became an increase in price that had to be passed on to the customer, and thus you built in further inflation. So industry itself has got a hand in this battle. Labor has a handle in this battle to ensure the protection, but we're going to do everything we can, and I am convinced that as this continues to go down, right now interest rates are still higher than they need to be, cannot be justified on the basis of present inflation. It can only be a lack of faith that the government in Washington is going to stay the course. You maybe heard that expression before. Uh, <laughs> and continue this fight. They, they're still skeptical that we might go back to the old ways of the artificial stimulant and then the increased inflation. Well, I'd say over my dead body, but there are too many people willing to take me up on that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, we understand your recent recommendations concerning the deregulation of natural gas allows for a renegotiation of the contracts. Is it possible for this type of approach to be used in reference to government timber sale contracts? This is what, as I say, I have someone in my office right now that is looking into this in all the administrative terms, and I know that this is what's on the senator's mind also, and this is something very definitely to, to be looked at. We know there are two industries in this country that either one of them alone can start a depression or recession. 
the housing industry, the automobile industry. And because of the high interest rates, we got a double whammy. It came from both. And it started, it was evident clear back in 19, well, late 78 and then 79, and just kept on skyrocketing and, and going to the present situation that we have. So um, those are all things that we want to look at because we realize that half of the unemployment today may be structural and is the need for training for new industries and new jobs. The other half of it is brought on by the recession, and the only way to get that half back to work is to get this economy moving again. Thank you. Mr. President, you may be aware that proposed additional wilderness legislation in the West would take millions of acres of land from our existing timber base. Would you consider vetoing any unreasonable wilderness proposals? You use the right word there to allow me. I usually am reluctant to talk in advance about what I will or won't veto. If it's unreasonable, it'd be vetoed. But uh, I know that problem also. And you know there has been a great effort spread over a number of years by the government to get m possession of more land. Now, the United States government owns one-third of all the real estate in the United States. And the bulk of that is here in the West. And they've, they've used various devices to do it. In 66, when I was running for governor, and I remember I addressed a forestry products group in San Francisco, and my opponent went out and said that I, in my address, had said that if you've seen one tree, you've seen them all. I never said any such thing. Uh, the, um, but the, the, then it was outdoor recreational land. You remember that there was a big wave. They were even foreclosing on some mining claims, and they were buying up land and, uh, and using eminent domain to do it, claiming that it was needed for the future so there would be outdoor recreational space. Well, finally, when they'd exhausted about all they could do with that, then came the environmental surge and the urge that for the environment we must do. We have 80 million acres of wilderness land now. This is land that you cannot... Uh, have a road in or anything of the kind. It's there because out of the 250 odd million Americans in this country, we realize that at least 240 million of them are backpackers who want to <laughs> hike into that wilderness area. But at one time, one of the public officials in, in some of this land acquisition in Washington made a statement that was shocking. He said, in the beginning, we urged the private ownership in order to get development of the land. Now it is necessary for government to regain control over the land. And I realize, yes, there are some areas that I think still should be protected that are so unique. I mean, in addition to the 80 million, to add to those. But let's be reasonable and sensible about that. And uh, uh, we intend to be. And if there is definite reason from an aesthetic and a, uh, the uniqueness of the land, a, a, a standpoint to do that, to add that to the wilderness, fine. But not to go out on the wholesale amounts that, the, that they are talking. Because uh, that wasn't the, in, the intention. And the private sector has not been guilty of rape of all the natural resources. There is today in the United States as much forest as there was when Washington was at Valley Forge. And uh, the industry itself now, with its sustained yield approach, uh, replanting as it cuts. There was a period once upon a time when there were so few people and this country loomed so big and unexplored that yes, people used and then moved on. But uh, that isn't true anymore. And. Uh, no, I was just going to say no. we have time for one more short question, Mr. President. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on. answering them too long. But I'm, <laughs> Mr. President, many of our mills have their backs against the wall. They actually can't hold out much longer. Could you help to speed up the effort to find a solution to our timber contract problem? Yes, we shall work as fast as we can. I know that uh, some other things, I know that the threat of some subsidized uh, import into America and so forth is uh, being investigated by ITA, and that report is due in in, in uh, July, but I know also that our Commerce Department is looking at 
uh, some of that, uh, and he expects to have an answer in May uh, after a thorough investigation. But yes, we want to do everything we can because, as I say, your industry and all that surrounds it, housing and so forth, uh, this can start and this can end a recession, this industry. And it's, it's encouraging that, and the word that was spoken about employees that are back at work, just last October, the unemployment in your industry was just about 22%. It is now down to 14.1%. Uh, that's still too high, much too high. But that shows quite a sizable drop from October uh, to the present, and we know that the housing starts are up at a level of about annualized a million seven. So uh, we're going to do everything we can. Our idea is that when I said in my State of the Union address, uh, I know some people cheered the one line, but cheered for the wrong reason when I said that government has a part to play. Yes, it does. Government has a part to play by not doing the stupid things that it's been doing for so many years and by getting out of the way and getting off the back of business and industry. Well, I won't try to top that. <laughs> well, Mr. President, we just can't thank you enough for sharing your insight uh, into our forest products industry with us here today. It obviously is a historic day, a memorable occasion for all of us. We will make every effort to build on the spirit of cooperation you have extended to us. We believe we can play a very major role. We visit here in Klamath Falls with our industry here today. We'd like to have you take that home with you. Well, thank you very much. I'd be very proud and happy to have that. Thank you. Well, I guess the time has come to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President.